You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. A blast from the past joins us on this episode of Sox in the Basement. Ed Sherman, who uh, wrote for the Tribune, covering the White Sox. That was his first beat, really, back in the 80s, is going to be joining us, telling us some stories and uh, giving us some perspective on this very weird season. He's got an interesting take that I have yet to hear, and I want your reaction about it, Ed. So that's coming up later on. And also, the brand new Sox in the Basement online store has launched. Are you as excited as I am? Because I worked my butt off this week to get this thing off the ground. You think you worked your butt off? I had to take pictures of myself and a bunch of shirts. <laughs> I love the poses. I absolutely love them. Like, I'll, I'll tell you the behind the scenes on this. So we come up with the idea of we want to put out some shirts. We get a lot of people who are always asking, like, hey, uh, I can't make it out to your events. I'd love to get some swag. Uh, you know, why don't you guys put together any kind of online giveaways like like other people do? And and I just, online stores just vexed me. Like, I was looking at it like, I don't know how to deal you with were, shipping. You were vexed. I was vexed. Shipping and tax and, you know, how do we make them and everything else like that. And so this was like a, a problem that was in the back of our minds for years. And we finally kind of worked our way to... To an end point where we know now how we can fulfill the orders, do something high quality. Because I don't want to sell things. I don't want people buying a shirt that falls apart after the first time they wash it. So I wanted to make sure we could do that. And I didn't like flash sales necessarily because you get the you get it up there and you sell it for a couple of weeks and then it goes away when you go through a company that does those. And I didn't want to buy like massive amounts of stuff in bulk because I didn't have anywhere to put it here. So we had to come up with a solution, which we came up with. It works out really well. We know the manufacturer personally that's doing this. Uh, we were able to go through all of the different designs, get them all set up. And then I get the first prototypes and Ed sends me these four shirts, the pictures of them. The first thing I said was they don't look right. Remember that? I was like, there's something wrong with them here. Yeah, the, the pictures, you just you were, you were not pleased with the pictures, and you said you showed them around, and everyone's like, they, they, they just don't look right. It looked like the logos were too small. And then I ask you about it, and you're like, I don't know, they look great on me. And you put it on, and here's the difference, and this is great, folks. Normally, when you see somebody modeling a shirt, we're talking about somebody who's a small or a medium at best. Right, we got models. We got people with washboard abs. Handsome, got- handsome, gorgeous people with, <laughs> with flatness in places that's supposed to be flat, and right. muscles in places that are supposed to have muscle. Right, everything is everything's put together right. That's not your typical White Sox fan. So what Ed did when he was helping design the shirts at the end point, he went with the XLs. Are they XLs or two XLs that you got? They were big uh, ones, right? XLs. Those are XLs, XLs okay. that are in the photos. Yeah. And you got you got a bit of a gut, my friend. I don't want you know. I don't think a I'm embarrassing bit. you because bit. you you took the pictures and and you showed it off in a couple of those pictures that you've got got a little girth going on there. And and what we did is like Ed goes and puts the shirts on for me on on like a video screen. Like I called him up at his house and I was like, these things don't work. We're gonna have to redo them. And he goes, hold on, let me put one on for you. And he puts the shirt on, and it turns out the reason that the logo looks small is because it was on a shirt meant for somebody who was large. And that's why I thought it was disproportionate. He puts the shirt on. These shirts are made for whatever size you are. So depending on the size you are, this is not like a one-size-fit-all shirt. So again, the higher quality, but I didn't get it until you put it on. It fits you perfectly. And I said, well, you're going to have to model the shirts because I want to represent the everyman, and you're the everyman, my friend. You got gray in the beard, you got the gut, you make funny faces, and so all of the pictures, our model is Ed for all of the shirts on the site, and you can go to the store at SaxInTheBasement.com right now, and you can check them all out if you didn't see the, the images put up on social media, but there's four different shirts, and then I also put up the one thing we're always asked for, people want the banners, I, I don't understand why, but people want a socks in the basement banner that they can put up in their man cave, their bar, uh, their garage, wherever they like to hang out and drink. People want those things. 
It's one of the ones that we would use. It's the exact same ones that we would put up at events that people are always asking, can I have this? And I'm always like, no, we need these for the next event. Now you can go and you can buy one of those as well. And we're going to add other things to the store. But right now it's four specific shirts that I think are all very funny. They're, they are some funny shirts that poke fun at the organization, the way things go with the White Sox. And one of them that just expresses our love for Jake Berger and the fact that he should always be playing in this lineup. And and then we have the banner in there and you can go to SoxInVasement.com right now and you can start buying that swag. And uh, hopefully we don't run out of supplies. I think we're, we we're pretty good on suppliers, but get in there and get them. I, I kept them very reasonable, $20 t-shirts and then there's shipping and tax. But I mean, like people have been asking forever, Ed, and it, it's time to, to launch. And now this. we can finally deliver. Well, we're coming up on our 500th episode here. In like a few weeks, I it just kind of crept up on me. Wow! And I'm like, after 500 episodes without an online store, we got to get one. So we got. Yeah, we one. should probably we should probably <laughs> rectify that situation. <laughs> that was like the last thing we did. Like there are podcasts that probably have four episodes and 20 shirts available, but we, on the other hand, have almost 500 episodes, and we finally came up with four shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's how we roll. It's always been about the content and it's brought to you by Cork and Carrie at the park in the shadow of the ballpark, the official home of the podcast for fans, by fans, socks in the basement, pregame, postgame. It's your home base for White Sox viewing. Uh, get out there with the kids, have something to eat, get one of the uh, wonderful drinks, the beers, the craft beers, the wine, the the spirits at that beautiful bar, indoor, outdoor seating. Afterwards, have a drink and commiserate or celebrate after a White Sox game. Again, in the shadow of the ballpark at 33rd and Princeton, see more at corkandcarry.com. I don't want to get into this Tim Anderson thing the way that everybody else is doing. Well, I think I feel like for everybody else, this is news. And I feel like for you and I, we have gone over Tim Anderson a lot. And we've covered over the past all two this. years. We covered this last year when nobody wanted to talk about it. The infidelity. We talked about what was going on in his life. We asked whether or not that was having an effect on his play in the second half of the season. We asked those questions and there were people that were like, I can't believe you brought that up. Well, now he's in an interview basically saying, well, you know, I was affected. I don't think it's worth rehashing and diving into it. I think the only thing I want to say is this one, if you're in the public eye and I see a lot of people trying to say, Oh, you don't know what it's like to walk in his shoes and, you know, getting criticized by the public. Let me tell you something right now. The moment you're in the public eye in any respect, podcaster, small time radio, DJ, minor league baseball player. Trust me. You're aware that if you do something that you're going to have public opinion on what you do, you, you are very aware of it. And we're not talking about a teenager here. We're talking about a grown man who markets his name and his image and his likeness and, and his own style and design jerseys with the team uh, for marketing dollars. OK, so he understands public image. He didn't like get tricked into something here. He made a decision. And I'm not going to sit there and pass judgment because in the end, I really don't care. Right. If you're a good person and you're a good ball player, that's like icing on top of the cake. But there are the, the Major League Baseball and professional sports are littered with people with all kinds of blemishes on their on their character and what they did off the field and everything else like that. And you know what really matters to me? It matters to me that the guy that's making millions of dollars plays good baseball. And that's all I care about. Honestly, that's all I care about. The other stuff is between him and his wife and everybody else that's involved in it and his own personal issues. The one thing that bothers me is every time he's got something going on off the field or every time he takes criticism he doesn't. He isn't the guy that comes out and proves you're wrong. He's the guy whose numbers suffer because of it. And, you know, for all the things I like about him, he's a good shortstop and he has been the face of the franchise for years. And I'm not going to discount any of that. And I am not sitting here telling you run him out of town on a rail because you don't agree with something that happened here in his life. I'm not going to tell you that because honestly, if he was playing well, I don't care. I really don't. My only concern is he's got to at some point say, it's time to go and do the job that I was paid to do. And you got to push that stuff back and you got to go out there and perform. Because trust me, the guy working a union wage who's got problems at home still has to show up and perform at work. And if he's doing bad, he might not keep his job either. Yeah. And really, again, it's not about defending the guy and it's not about criticizing the guy. It's not about judging the guy for his choices. It, it's really, this is, this is what, as a baseball fan, for any team, for any player you expect, right? You expect them to show up and when they're between the lines, play the game, do a good job. Off the field, you don't have to love their choices. You don't have to love them as a person. 
and that's fine, but you can, you know, you can separate what they do on the field, what they do off the field, and you can decide whether or not to be a Tim Anderson fan for yourself. And it doesn't make a difference. What makes a difference to the White Sox, whether or not the White Sox are going to win the division this year, whether or not the White Sox are going to go anywhere is, well, the most talented bat on their team, and that's what Tim Anderson is, this side of Luis Robert, Tim Anderson may have the most talented bat on this team. Is he going to live up to his full potential and play up to his full potential, even if he's not somebody that we're going to sit there and talk about building a statue to him or whatever? And really, honestly, you know, for whatever whatever you're going through in your life, whoever you are, if you have something that you're paid to do, you got to do it to the best of your ability, regardless of what's going on. In the end, all I really care about is that if he plays baseball well. That's it. Just go play baseball. Socks in the Basement listeners, if you're looking for exterior windows, doors, patio doors, storm doors, remember your first and probably your only stop is going to be at Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. No high-pressure sales. They're not in your kitchen. Their feet aren't up on your couch. Instead, you come into their showroom. You check out all of the examples, full size, no sample size. You see all the window etchings and the differences in doorknobs and and all the little extras in person instead of looking in a catalog. The owners in showroom, there's an owner on site. They use their own installers. They don't farm out the work. That's how you get quality. They've been doing that for 40 years in Oak Forest since 1985. All major brands, custom made, no stock items, for a perfect fit. Stop in and see them a half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. For the younger folks out there, I want to introduce them to Ed Sherman. He joins me on the line. Ed was a beat reporter covering the White Sox for the Tribune back in the 80s. He currently uh, writes for different White Sox publications. You might see it inside of the program or or in other publications the White Sox will put out. How are you, Ed? Great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, thanks for coming on. So, so first of all, tell me what it was like covering that team back in the 80s. I would imagine you had a lot of La Russa. Did you have any other regimes that you also covered? Oh, yeah. I had one of the greatest. I started, I got put on the White Sox when I was 26 years old. In 1986, so my first year was Hawk Harrelson's year, and uh, you want to talk about trial by fire? I mean, that was just crazy. I think everyone remembers how how uh, tumultuous that year was, and and uh, Tony Larusa getting fired in June, and uh, you know, and the team just kind of um, going fits and starts with with Hawk, and Hawk eventually uh, stepped down in that September. So it was uh, it was pretty. <laughs> It was a pretty good learning experience. I will tell you uh, one of my one of my favorite pieces of trivia from of covering that team. I think what will astound people. I think that team lost eighty nine games. Associated with that team, there were seven people in the Hall of Fame. Uh, people will get probably get Carlton Fisk and Harold Baines and Tom Seaver. So that's three three of the all time greats. Um, Steve Carlton came, if you remember, came in like August of that year. He was on the, on the end of his career and he was just trying to hang on. So they had Steve Carlton. They had Tony La Russa was the manager. So that's five. And then the broadcaster was the great Don Drysdale. So that's six. One of the great guys you'll ever met. One of my favorite guys of all time covering sports. And the seventh one is Hawk. He's in the broadcaster's wing of the Hall of Fame. So when you think about it, I was on a team that had seven players who were in the hall of fame or associated or seven people. Yeah. Seven people, players who were in the hall of fame. It, that's pretty incredible. When, uh, when you think about it for a team that lost 81 games. When I see all these players that are from the era that you covered and you bump into a lot of them, I mean, heck we've had Ron Kittle on the show before you, you bump into Harold Baines every once in a while, walk around the ballpark. A lot of these guys are around there. They're very affable. They're very kind. They're, they're, they're great storytellers. Uh, did they mellow out in their old age, or were they like that when you were covering them and they were on the ball field? Yeah, they were great. I mean, I really enjoyed covering them. They were all um, all really good people, and uh, they were, you know, they made it. I was a kid. I had no idea how to cover baseball. The Tribune just basically, you know, parachuted me in, literally, with, like, no guidance or anything. Um, I remember getting more help 
from Joe Goddard of the Sun Times, who just passed away recently, um, than anyone. And uh, Joe was a great guy and a legend, legendary baseball writer. But for the most part, all the guys were were terrific guys. Greg Walker, um, Bobby Thigpen was a year later. Uh, you know, I mean, Ozzy. I mean, that was Ozzy's second year, and you know, when I see Ozzy now, he'll still come up and give me a hug. You know, um, my big memory is covering Tom Seaver and and Carlton Fisk, who were two guys that were, you know, I, you know, ten, twelve years earlier, those guys were larger than life figures for me, and and now here I am, I'm trying to interview them, and if you if you can indulge me for a minute here, I've got a great. Probably my best story, my best memory of covering sports in anything is was with Tom Seaver. And let me just uh, give you this. Um, oh, go for it. You know, I, I, it's my first or second day of spring training. And Seaver, if you remember, wanted to be traded to the East Coast because he was in Chicago for two years. He wanted to be closer to home. They still hadn't traded him. He comes to spring training, 1986, and he's really upset. And he also, as I learned later, was the kind of guy that if you didn't know him, he was not, you know, he wanted nothing to do with you. And so he pitches his first game, an exhibition game, and um, and uh, he gets rocked. And he, I asked him some question about how he, how he did today, and he goes, how I did today? I, you know, it, it starts throwing ex- expletives in there. I, it's the first day of spring training. All I'm doing is throwing fastballs, you know. Who cares how I did today, you know. And he got really, okay, well, now I'm off to a great start with him, you know. And, again, he, he was hard to get to know. I don't know, for whatever reason, he took a liking to me, or maybe I was just around a lot, but, he, but we got to know each other. So he eventually gets traded to Boston. And if you remember, Boston goes to the World Series. And who are they playing? The Mets. The greatest Mets of all time is playing, you know, would have been playing in that series, but he was hurt. He was hurt, and he did not, you know, he hurt his knee in uh, in September of that year, and it effectively ended his career. He didn't pitch in that series. And, again, he was pretty surly, and he didn't want anything to do with the New York media, nothing. He didn't want to talk. He declined all interviews. Usually the locker rooms were closed during a World Series, but there was it was raining, so there was no batting practice. So they let us in the locker rooms, and I'm in the lot. I see Tom. Hey Tom, how are you doing? Great. Hey, can I you know can I talk to you for a few minutes for a story? Sure. And he taught you know we start talking, and all of a sudden, you know the other media see that he's talking, and they kind of come circling around him. Anyway, he went f this, and he walks away, and I'm like thinking, okay, well there goes my interview. And I'm standing in the locker room. All of a sudden, I hear, I hear real softly, Ed, Ed, you know, really kind of, Ed, Ed. And I look, and he was, I look, and he's kind of peeking out from a closet. And he's waving me over. He's waving me over. And it was a broom closet. I swear to God, it was a broom closet. He was waving me over, and he wanted to take care of me. I did that interview in a broom closet. And I just thought that was the greatest thing ever that Tom Seaver really went out of his. He wanted, and I think I might have been one of the only people that he talked to during that series. But the way that he went out of his way to take care of me, it was just really just, that's probably my, you know, given the stature of who he was and his magnitude in baseball and in sports in general, for him to like go out of his way. And I can always say I interviewed Tom Seaver in, in a broom closet. So I'm sorry if that's a long story, but uh, that's. You know, when I think about covering that team, that's the story I always go to. No, that's absolutely, that's awesome. I love that story. That's really cool. Uh, you know, you you cover this team when you were younger, like you said. You, you, you started off, your first year was a volatile year. You know, a young reporter right now that's been covering the White Sox for the last couple of years by the name of James Fegan for The Athletic just found out yeah. that his beat, along with 20 <sighs> other major sports beats, were eliminated by the athletic. They're going to cover everything else in town except for the White Sox. That's just crazy. You know, I mean, I, I, I in fact, I dro- dropped James a line uh, via Twitter uh, note. I mean, that's the main reason why I bought the athletic was for James, his coverage of the White Sox. You know, first off, to, for context, I'm a huge White Sox fan. My da- I, I grew up in the North Side, but my dad was a a Sox fan, so hence I became a Sox fan. And, uh, you know, uh, so it's a lot, you know, uh, and it's probably the first thing I look at in the morning and, you know, often last time, last thing I look at before I go to bed is some what's going on in Twitter with the White Sox, you know, and, 
And especially with James, I thought, I mean, James was just as a beat guy and still is because he'll get some, get something. He's so insightful. He had such great information. He, his analysis and analytics, use of analytics, which was very accessible, but it told you so much about, you know, things that were going on. He just went so above and beyond. And for that to happen, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm really considering, you know, dumping the athletic because uh, I just think it's, uh, it was terrible what they did. And it's kind of, I didn't realize they didn't get any word of any other beat writers in town. So the White Sox is the only one, or the only one they're not going to cover it. I mean, that's terrible. I felt really bad about that. I, and I, I said to James, if he, you know, if he started a subscription site that I would, I would definitely subscribe. And I think a lot of other people would too. So let's see what happens from there. Hopefully he'll land. Hopefully he'll come back and we'll be able to read his stuff because it's, I mean, I've been reading a lot of baseball and he, he got it. He was new, new age, but he also was accessible as far as, um, being able to explain it to you in a way that you understand. Ed Sherman and every guest here on Socks in the Basement brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure. Visit the Village of Lamont, shop, dine, drink, explore, and check out Q on Canal, a barbecue competition and festival this Sunday. I'm making it a part of my plans on Father's Day. How do you pass up a barbecue festival? See more at LamontDowntown.com. Ed, before I let you go, I got to ask you, what's going to happen here with this team? You covered a lot of White Sox baseball over the years. They're not that many games out of first place, but they're a lot more when it comes to games under 500. Well, I mean, it's kind of a little bit of an unknown this year because they've dropped from night from playing 19 games against each team in the division to 12. So that means that the Twins and also the White Sox and the other teams aren't going to be playing <laughs> Aren't going to be feeding to get uh, on the Royals and, and the Tigers, and to a certain extent now the the Guardians. Um, um, so I I do think it's a possibility that we could have a winner out of this division that's sub 500, um, maybe you know 79 wins or something like that. So that would be four games under 500. So having said that, with well, the White Sox right now, 10 games under 500, and they've kind of you know been creeping between eight and 14 games under 500 in the last month or so, you know, you have to, they have to sustain some winning, some winning. And I think they, they've got a pretty tough stretch ahead of them with, uh, you know, they're not going to play another division game, I think until the end of July, something like that. Like everyone else, other Sox fans, I'm pretty frustrated. I, I'm kind of wondering if this team really implodes, what, what, whether or not there'll be a change in the front office. 10 years is a long time, you know, to kind of have the same regime with really not, you know, not great results. And you look, and the thing that really scares me right now about the White Sox and their future is that I just don't see, I don't see that farm system having, having players that are going to come up. Um, certainly not superstar impact players like you're seeing other teams. Ed Sherman. Big White Sox fan who got his big break uh, covering the beat in a tumultuous year in 1986 uh, when White Sox baseball was all about Tony La Russa and Hawk Harrelson. And, uh, you know, I don't know, like the more things change, the more they stay the same, Ed. Uh, we're still sitting around with a, with a team that we don't know where they're going. And, and uh, it's, it's more of what's going on with the quotes in the media than, uh, than what's happening on the field, unfortunately. But I really appreciate you jumping on here on Sox in the basement and uh, and sharing some of your stories and talking with us about some of this stuff and and you're welcome back anytime hey chris thanks a lot please call me again um I, as i said i'm pretty pretty passionate about the white Sox, and you know i'm hoping hoping to see another world series before you know before i say goodbye to everybody Socks in the Basement listeners do the hard work. And if you're a hardworking man or woman on the South Side, you need to be outfitted properly. And that's why you should visit Red Wing Shoes in Evergreen Park, New Lenox, and Geneva. A work boot specialty store that carries sizes from 6 to 16 and feet as wide as 4E. A 115-year-old company that came out of Red Wing, Minnesota. And one of its largest stores in the entire Midwest is in Evergreen Park, Illinois, ever since 1976. When you're on your feet, the footwear is everything. So why not get an expert fitting? They warranty, repair, and offer free conditioning with laces. 
and they also carry Carhartt work clothing as well. Located at 3347 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park, Illinois, at 208 East Maple Street on Route 30 in New Lenox, or at 1749 South Randall Road in Geneva. Visit them today. You work hard. You've earned it. Red Wing Shoes. So Ed Sherman brings up something that I had not thought of, and it's an interesting point, and I don't think I've heard a lot of people bring this up. Everybody's just going to get beat up by the better divisions in the Central. They're going to get beat up by the West, and they're going to get beat up by the East evenly and not have a lot of cupcake games that you could very easily have a team finish with the division lead under 500. I mean, do you think that's possible? I mean, I had not had that put to us in any way by anybody on this show. And he's basically saying, no, 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 the schedule's different this year. If the Central's that damn bad, then the Central may have a team under 500 that makes the postseason. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I yes. Why? Why? Yeah, I, I, there's, there's mathematically, he's right. Okay, in in an unbalanced schedule situation where you're playing your division more, the Twins would have the opportunity to sit there and just, you know, they could put the White Sox out of everybody's misery by just lengthening their lead by sweeping a series against them. Or same thing with the Guardians. Uh, you know, you sit there and you just pick on the Kansas City Royals as everyone's been doing since 2015. There's, there's a lot of different. Ways to, to kind of view that, but if you're sort of if you're playing this this new schedule and and you have everybody kind of has the, the same opportunity of getting beat, what's really going to come down to it is probably something more along the lines of like, do the White Sox have a homestand where they've got some easy games while the Twins are out on the road in what's going to be a tough road trip for them, and you're going to have a little bit more luck of the draw in that regard, or just getting hot when the other team is not. And it's not going to be a situation where you can kind of control your own destiny from the, as a team coming from behind because you can't necessarily beat the Twins to catch up to them. But at the same time, they can't run away with it. So, yeah, if, if the Twins are as bad as we think they might be, if the Guardians continue to underwhelm the way that they've underwhelmed, if the White Sox continue to underwhelm as much as they've underwhelmed, then when they're facing the Rangers, when they're facing anybody from the AL East, when they're facing anybody who's good, basically – if the Sox are going to lose two out of three, there's a chance the Twins will lose that same two out of three, that the Guardians will lose that same two out of three too. And it may just come down to, at the end of the season, how many times did the White Sox twist that two out of three loss into a series win and the Twins weren't able to do that or the Guardians weren't able to do that. And it may not make a difference. It may very well be that the AL Central is a team that's 500 or below. And so getting to 500 is, I think, a nice... I think it becomes a nicer thing for us as fans and maybe even the players to sit there and go, we know if they can make it to 500 and they can finish over 500, it was a, they've earned it, right? They've earned the season. They've earned the playoff berth. They've earned the division. If they finish under 500, it's just basically, to quote or paraphrase Cubs manager David Ross, thank God for everybody else's crappy play. So here, I'm going to make a little counterpoint to it. I get the idea of I'd rather look at the fact they're five and a half back, at least as we're sitting here talking right now, rather than look at the fact that they are nine games under 500. All right. I'd rather look at that smaller number and think we have a better chance. But as we sit here, 30 and 39 with an expected win loss of 29 and 40, they have a negative 52 run differential. They're 17 and 17 at home, 500, or 13 and 22 on the road, and they're 16 and 30 against teams that are greater than 500. But when I look at the Twins, who are 35 and 33, their expected win loss is actually 39 and 29, 10 games over. They've been unlucky. Where the White Sox have actually had just a slight amount of luck when you compare the record to the expected record, they've been very unlucky. Their run differential isn't negative 52, it's positive 44. They are 20 and 14, six games over at home. They're not 500 at home. They're only four games under on the road. They're not nine games under on the road. Their wins against teams that are over 500, they're 17 and 19 as compared to the White Sox at 16 and 30. So in the end, Minnesota has shown that they can actually do better against the better teams than the White Sox can and actually have been a little unlucky, and we're just fortunate they're so close. 
This team isn't going to sit around 500. I think Minnesota is going to be a team that's going to finish 10 over 500. I would believe that more. I think they're going to they're going to get back to where they're expected win losses are or close to it. So I don't think you're going to have a team that finishes under 500 when I look at how Minnesota has gotten to where they're at, where they're still actually two over 500 right now in first place. I'm saying they they could be a lot more. And as long as they keep doing what they're doing, they're going to extend that lead and they're going to get further over 500. So I know it's kind of a nice idea to think that you could you can catch this team even if you stay under 500. I still, though, believe looking at that, the Twins aren't going to drop that far back to you. Well, you know what? I mean, you're right, of course. And 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 the you know the idea that the under 500 team could win it presupposes that everyone's bad, but. Like all Twinkies, you look at them and you sort of expect one thing, and then you actually eat the things. You're like, no, those were those were better than I thought they were going to be. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, I'm not ending the show on that. I'll end it on telling people that they should go to the Socks in the Basement store and get a shirt. Okay? Get a shirt. Everybody's been asking for shirts. Get a shirt. Socks in the Basement. Socks in the Basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.